All right, let's look at Matthew 13, and we're getting into the next two parables tonight. So we have covered the first two. The first one was the guy throwing seeds everywhere and the seeds landing in different places, and they had a different effect. Uh, some fell on the hard ground, the birds ate it up, and some fell on stony ground. They grew up, but then the sun came out and killed it. Others fell on the thorns, and they never produced fruit. And then some fell on good ground, and there was a variety of, of uh, increase from 100 to 60 to 30-fold. And Jesus interpreted that. He said the birds were the eating the seeds was like the devil snatching people's the word right out of someone's heart uh, that the, the seed on the shallow ground was somebody who um, they received their word quickly but they had no depth themselves and, and as soon as they had a persecution or difficulty because they were believers they give it up and then other the people in the thorns or the seed in the thorns was like a person who heard the word received it but they were choked out by the cares of the world and then the last is the person who heard the word and it produced fruit. Um, the next parable was the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. So this uh, guy planted his crop, and then he went to sleep, and he woke up, and there were all these weeds everywhere. And, and an enemy had come in in the night and planted these weeds in his, in his uh, farm, and his servants wanted to rip them all up. And they said, no, we'll wait till the end. And, and Jesus interpreted that. He said that, the good seed, the one sowing the good seeds, the son of man, the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the, um, the sons of the wicked one and the enemy who sowed them was the devil. And so just leave them, grow together, and at the end, the angels will separate them out. So these two parables are interpreted for us. The rest of the parables are not interpreted. So it's at this point that um, we're going to try to follow some good rules of biblical interpretation. And, and I think when it comes to interpreting things, the best and most important rule is to try to remain consistent. So that uh, in these parables that were interpreted, the field was the world. So if we have a parable that's got a field, we're going to assume that that's the world. Um, and we'll let the images as they're used, if they're used somewhere else in a symbolic way, and generally in the Bible, uh, the way something's used in a symbolic way is pretty consistent through the Scripture. So uh, keeping that in mind, we'll, we'll try to look at um, these next two, the next parables, and we're going to cover two tonight. And they, I think, have the same uh, emphasis, the same message, essentially, uh, with a slight difference. So verse 31, Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took, and sowed in his field, and indeed, uh, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So this is a um, kind of a, a picture of some kind of exponential growth. You start with this mustard seed. Um, again, we've got a man sowing a seed in a field. So we don't have to guess about that interpretation, right? We've had that already happened, uh, the sower was Jesus, the, the seed's the word of God, here's this planting, this, this work that started, the field's the world, so there's this work going on, it starts out really small, this mustard seed, but then it grows up, uh, it says into a tree, uh, it grows, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, and then the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So this parable along with the next one, um, another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was leavened. That one's very short. So uh, leaven spreading out through the meal and then everything was all completely permeated with the leaven. So uh, a popular interpretation of, of both of these parables is that the kingdom of God is going to spread throughout the whole world. And... Uh, it's going to have an influence everywhere, just like you put the leaven in the dough, it's going to fill the whole dough, dough and, and just like this little seed grows into a tree and even the birds can nest in it, that the Word of God is going to fill the world. I've got a lot of commentaries and this is what they assert that this means. Um, I don't think that's what it means I, and I'll tell you a couple reasons why. Uh, first of all, we live in an area, you know, we live in an agricultural area, so we actually have mustard fields. We, we actually can see the mustard when it's growing. The mustard fields are beautiful. 
Um, they're not trees. That best, they're a big bush. And a bird can nest in a bush, but the picture here is of something that has grown into something bigger than it is. It's, it's not just an exponential growth in this case. It is that, but then it's an abnormal growth. If you went into your backyard and there was a mustard tree in your backyard, that would be weird. That's not normal. That's an abnormal growth. And the birds are nesting in it. And if we're going to stay consistent, have birds already been mentioned in these parables and interpreted for us? They actually have. If you look in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So that's an interpretation of verse 4. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it. When Jesus interprets it, he said, you know those birds that are eating the seed? That's the devil snatching the word out of someone's heart. So just to stay within the context of this one particular chapter, even in not going beyond that, you've, you've got uh, birds representing the enemy. And so my personal feeling would be I'd rather just stick with the interpretation that Jesus gave us. Now, this doesn't mean I'm right, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I might be right. I might have a 50-50 chance. It might be a 101 chance. I don't know what it is, but uh, I personally would just, I, I just like to have sort of, uh, I'm not really interested in allegorizing the scripture or finding secret meanings. I don't think that God hid secret meanings all over the Bible. He might have. He's awesome. He, I'm sure maybe we get to heaven and we'll find out that, you know, if you actually give a numeric value to all the letters and you put that on a piece of paper and you painted it, you'd have a picture of the earth. I don't know. I mean, who knows? I mean, God, God's smart enough to do anything he wanted. The problem with all that is God gave us the Bible in a language that could be understood. It's easy to translate Hebrew into English or Hebrew into another language or Greek into English or Greek into another language. And God gave us the Bible in plain, simple language to tell us who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. So personally, I'm just, that's just, I'm just not into that. So um, I look at this in terms of, well, we already have had some interpretation. The birds have been representative of the devil. So now I've got, and I know what a mustard bush looks like. And it doesn't look like a tree, and it doesn't grow into a tree. So if I think of the kingdom of God is like something that should grow and be wonderful, but instead it's going to grow abnormally large, bigger than it really is, so that even the devil finds a place within it. That to me looks like church history, actually. Has the organized church that calls itself Christendom or in the name of Jesus, has the church always represented the Lord? Are there such a thing as the Crusades? Is there such a thing as the Inquisition? Is there such a thing as religious persecution by the church in the name of Jesus? Absolutely. Throughout church history, um, there's not... uh, you know, there's not a lot positive to say about the imperialism and the domination of the organized state religious systems. Um, whether it was an English version of it or a French version of it or an Italian version of it or whatever country. So um, I think what Jesus is telling us here and what he's getting at with this parable is similar to the next one, and that is... Um, what you're going to see happening is going to be troubling. There's, there's, and, and, and so he's not telling us to look for some kind of perfection on the earth in the visible expression of Christianity. You're just not going to find it. You're going to find birds nesting in the branches. And the next parable, which was very simple, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Here's the interesting thing about leaven. It is never used positively in the Bible. It almost, it, it, when, it's, when it's referring actually to leaven, it's still, in a sense, being used in a symbolic way because the first mention of leaven is when God tells the Israelites to get it out of their house because they're having the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there's a reason for that. God's getting ready to make this point really clear. Uh, you know, when, we, when we have communion, you know, we, we generally will get unleavened bread. Jesus you know, is the fulfillment of this Feast of Unleavened Bread that his, his body is without sin. Uh, in the New Testament, the word leaven is used a bunch of times, and every single time it's used negatively. 
every single time. So when he says the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, you guys that know your Bible, I mean, I remember the first time I, I, I was reading through these after having read through the Old Testament and having heard some sermons about leaven or the effect of leaven, and I remember just that phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. You go, whoa, what? <laughs> what do you mean the kingdom of heaven is like leaven? The kingdom of heaven ain't going to have any leaven in it. You know, leaven is that agent that's introduced to the pure dough and it spreads by rottenness and fermentation and it creates these air pockets and gas pockets that make your bread rise and make it, you know, what we would prefer. But, or maybe you don't prefer, maybe you like crackers, but I pref- which I would prefer, I should speak for myself, uh, which I would prefer, but, but, it, but it's, a, it's a spreading, essentially a spreading by rottenness. And so what a picture And so leaven's always used negatively as something that spreads, but it's a corruption. And so when he says the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, um, I don't know. I read a bunch of my commentaries until I stopped as they were spinning this. You know, like, well, it doesn't really mean this. But every single time leaven's used in the Bible, it's used in a negative way. Um, Or if it's it's really referring to leaven, it's, it's, it's God preparing the way to show the symbolism of it being negative. So... He says, a woman took this and hid it in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. Even the idea of hiding it, it's like this stuff's here, but I'm sneaking it in. I'm sneaking it in, but then when I'm done sneaking it in, you know, the whole thing, it's spread everywhere. Now, the way I would in- interpret these parables is that Jesus is giving us what I would, what I would just, I don't know what else to say, it is a warning, um, or I don't know, maybe a heads up, you know, uh, be aware of this. This might, not, this might catch you off guard. This might not be what you were expecting about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven is going to be like leaven. And the kingdom of heaven is going to have some abnormal, unnatural growth. And you're going to actually find the devil nesting. Some pockets where the devil can uh, do his thing. And, and in both of these parables, there's something that's not right. Something that you look at and say, there's, not, there's something wrong with this picture. And the difference between the two is in the origin of the trouble. In the first parable, you've got the abnormal growth, but that doesn't seem to be the problem. The abnormal growth produces a place so that the trouble from without, the birds can come in and nest, and now you've got birds from the outside coming into it. And then in the second one, the leaven, the trouble is within. It's been, it's been inserted into it, and then from within it spreads. The birds coming from without and the leaven coming from within. And that, to me, as, an, as a very simple interpretation of a warning uh, for those of us that are interested in the kingdom of heaven, we want to spend our energy being part of the kingdom of heaven. Um, you know, you guys are interested in teaching Sunday school or helping out at the church or going on a missions trip or, you know, serving in some way. We want to share the gospel with your family. You're trying to disciple somebody. You want to be discipled yourself. You're here on Wednesday night. You're interested in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And, and I think this is Jesus trying to help us with one of the great challenges that we face, and that is um, there's trouble that's going to come from outside in, and then there's going to be trouble that's going to rise up from within. And he's warning us. I want you to save your place here, and let's look over as an example uh, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 The Apostle Paul is meeting with church leaders from Ephesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's traveling by boat. Uh, Ephesus is inland from the shore, and rather than travel all the way up into Ephesus on foot, he sends a message, and the elders come down to the beach and meet him as the boat's journeying along. And so they have this conference at the beach, which I think is where all good conferences on leadership should happen, on the Mediterranean at the beach. Um, but there they are in Miletus at the beach on the Mediterranean. And uh, they, they came to him, and, and he reminds them of his ministry there. But I want you to look near the middle of his exhortation, or maybe towards the end of his exhortation, starting in verse 28. This is now his, his charge to these leaders. He says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Paul would want them to take on the mindset of being on guard. When he says, take heed, that means pay attention. It's as though uh, you're in a boxing match, 
and you know you got some fast footwork and you're dropping your gloves and after the first round you go back to the corner and your you know coach jumps out in front of you and he says hey take heed and keep your left hand up in front of your face you're throwing your jab out there you're dropping your arm if if you're boxing and your coach tells you to take heed to something you really need to take heed to it why because if you don't listen to him you're going to get smacked in the face i mean when Paul's, Paul's not just saying this because he, he, it was, this is going to be in the Bible and probably there's going to be some generations this might apply to them. This is a, this, if you have a heart for the people of God and you've got a heart to see the work of God happening, then you need to be paying attention. Take heed means pay attention. It means be on guard, be alert, be aware. So take heed to two things, yourself and to the flock, and among which God's made you to be a, a shepherd, an overseer, your you're looking out for the other people. You're watching out for them. It's his church. He purchased it with his own blood. So if you wonder who the church is, it's Jesus's. He bought it. He owns it <laughs> by, by his own blood. That's the price that was paid. So why does he say, take heed to yourself and to the flock? Look at verse 29. Just, I think, like in the parables Jesus told us, the birds coming from without, the leaven working from within. Look what Paul says, starting in verse 29. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Trouble from outside. Verse 30, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves from within. Paul is talking to these guys and saying, listen, I'm charging you guys. You need to pay attention. You need to be on guard for yourself. You need to know what the Word of God is, what it says. You need to know who Jesus is. He'll tell Timothy later, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. You know, it's important. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, for in so doing you will save not only yourself, but also your hearers, he'll tell Timothy. There's a need for me to be abiding in Jesus myself, paying attention to the Word of God, and and letting the, the Spirit of God instruct me and to have a vibrant Christian life myself. And then, as I want to help other people, then I I need to help other people get that same thing and and the focus on Jesus. And there's a reason why, because from the outside, wolves are going to come into the flock with the idea of taking from the people of God things for themselves. A a wolf is not necessarily somebody who looks like a wolf. You know, the old Red Riding Hood, you know, grandmother, what big eyes you have. Well, the better to see you with, you know, and what big ears you have? Well, the better to hear you with. And then what big teeth? The better to eat you. <laughs> you know, it's a wolf in grandmother's clothing. And uh, depending upon which version you read, the woodcutter comes or Red Riding Hood gets eaten. I mean, I think the original one, she doesn't make it. But I hate to, I hate to ruin that story for you, but I think, she, I think she gets eaten. But anyway, you know, wolves are going to come from without. That's just a reality. I wish it wasn't so, but there are, there are people who are interested in our congregation for what they can get from you guys. They might appear nice. They might be like wolves in sheep's clothing. They might come like they're a shepherd. They might come and act like they're, a, they're helpful. But, but you can always tell a wolf because a wolf wants to eat sheep. That's just, they always want something. So that, that's one of the ways, you know, God gives a gift of discerning spirits. So I think we have many in the fellowship who have that gift. So there's a gift of discernment and operation, which we praise the Lord for. But also there's just, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. So what's the fruit of a wolf? He, he's, he's, wolves are those who are trying to get something from the people. That's, that's what they're after. So they're going to come from without, Paul said. But then also, this is even, I think, more difficult, verse 30 Also from among yourselves, men will rise up. So even from within the congregation, guys that you might have been, maybe you got saved at the same time, (laughs) or you grew up together, you're serving the Lord together, and all of a sudden the person starts to just become about themselves, or they're promoting themselves, or they're, I mean here, the way he puts it is they're speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. The word translated as perverse is a word that means uh, deformed. It means the thing is mostly normal, but it's just tweaked a little bit. And if you look at it, you go, that looks like exactly like a car, except for it doesn't really look like, I mean, something's not right with it. It's mostly normal, except for the part that's bent, 
something's not right. And so this will be people even from within, and then something's not right. Something goes wrong, and then they become interested in drawing people to attach people to themselves. A wolf is somebody who wants to attach people to themselves. Now, a good shepherd would want to connect people with who? <laughs> Jesus, right? How are, if you want to bear fruit, who do you have to be connected with? Jesus, right? Jesus said, if you abide in me and I'm abiding in you, then you'll bear much fruit. So for us who are involved in the kingdom of God and we want to see it expand or the kingdom of heaven, we want to help people get connected to Jesus, help them understand how much he wants to answer their prayer, teach people how to pray, teach them that you don't need someone to pray. I mean, yeah, it's okay to ask people to pray for you, but you can pray. God listens to you. Teach people to be connected to the Lord. A wolf comes in and says, don't worry about it. You can just connect to me. <laughs> and ultimately creating a relationship that allows them to, to take things for themselves. So it's from without and it's from within. And so what does Paul say to them? He gives them great counsel. Uh, verse 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I didn't cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So this is not the first time they've heard this warning. When he was with them, he knew his, his time with them would, would be limited. And so even, even through his ministry, he was warning them, listen, when I'm gone, make sure that you be on guard. And so verse 32, just wonderful practical advice for this danger. He says, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Paul, Paul realizing that there's danger from without and danger from within, here's, your, here's, our, here's our answer. God, he's our answer. Isn't that awesome to think about? When, when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside green pastures and still waters. He restores my soul. Even if I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Our solace and our security is in the fact that we have a personal relationship with the living God. He's our defense. He's our rock. And if there's an onslaught of satanic attack against us, then Paul's telling this church, I'm commending you to God. Okay. So praise the Lord. God's going to take care of us. And he will. He always will. So we look to him and to the word of his grace. God's given us his word. So we don't have to be afraid and, and I think right now, there's something that I've noticed, and I've seen it the last several years, maybe, maybe longer than several years now, maybe five or ten years. There, there's this kind of a weird thing that's, that I've seen on the Internet. I don't read it, but I see people refer to it, and I, I think maybe it's lost steam. I hope so. I hope they're disqualifying themselves. Um, I think they call themselves online discernment ministries. If you Google that later and you go check it out... Um, please exercise great caution. It seems like these people are unemployed and their goal is to just be interested in everybody else's business, like a busybody. Um, I'll have periodically people that'll call our church from other places. Have you heard about this? I'm like, no, I don't have time. I'm married. I got kids. Like, what? I don't know how you have time to be worried about what somebody else is doing in some other place. Like, get a life. Go evangelize somebody. Go preach the gospel to someone. Why don't you go visit the shut-ins? Why don't you go, go over to the convalescent home and get busy serving somebody and get off the internet critiquing what everybody else is doing? Um, I, don't, I don't think Paul's advocating a uh, spectator you know, from, the, from the peanut gallery you know, uh, judging everybody's ministry. Rick Warren did this, or this person did that, or whatever. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> get a life. Get saved. <laughs> Read your Bible and start walking with Jesus. To, so that's my rant. Uh, it's important. We're in a passage that's talking about it. We haven't really had a problem with it here. Um, and I thank God for it. I, I, to me, I think it's a big, fat waste of time. I think people spend way too much time imagining imaginary uh, opponents doing imaginary things that haven't ever even happened. Don't you think this? And what about this? And like, That doesn't even exist anymore. And everyone gets all fired up about it. Paul just simply says, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Isn't that simple? Isn't that wonderful? I'm not, I'm not worried about it. Why? Because we're teaching the Bible. 
I'm not worried about somebody coming here with false doctrine because even a person, even you guys that are pretty new in the church, maybe you've been here for a year or two years, you already have listened to quite a bit of the Bible. So if someone came in with weird doctrine, even though you might say, well, I'm still pretty new, your red alert alarm system will go off. They'll come in and go, I don't know, how are you baptized? And you're you're just going to go, wait, what? What are you talking about? What? What? We never did that. What is that about? The Spirit of God inside of you first, he'll warn you because I'm committing you to God. Uh, John wrote in 1 John, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you, you don't need anyone that you should teach you, but you know all things. The Spirit of God's inside of you so you'll know. And then secondly, we've got the Word of God. We've committed as a church body to go from Genesis to Revelation, start again at Genesis and go to Revelation, and again and again until I kill you guys. And some, I mean, I mean... Steve Edel's like, you, you, you know, like, I'm, I'm hanging in there. He told me the other day, it was like, I said I was going to be 64, you know, and when you finished, and now I'm 66. And I think he was telling me to hurry up, hurry it up, you know. Come on, third time through, get a move on. So there's, there's a reason why we would want to emphasize the Word of God. It's because it's what the Apostle said. It's because there's danger from without and danger from within. And what are we commended? It's to God himself and to the Word of his grace. It's that simple. The simple teaching of the Word of God. The Word of His grace. So we look to God. He alone can help us. We pray. We rely upon Him. We seek Him. We depend upon Him. We focus upon Him. And if that's what we're doing, then when someone rises up and they're trying to take the focus onto something else, I mean, we just finished Hebrews. And how does Hebrews end? What's the great exhortation in Hebrews? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Consider him. That's a, Jesus is better. So someone rises up within and says, I'm better. <laughs> Focus on me. We say, man, we just were in Hebrews, bro, for like a long time, dude. Like that, that smells like old baloney. I mean, I don't know what you're trying to sell, but we, we, have, we have the milk and the meat of the word. We've got the living water that comes from Jesus. Why? This act that you're doing is bizarre. What is that, man? You need to get right with the Lord. It's just that simple. The Word of God will keep us in a place looking to Him. The Word of God never changes. It's the standard. It's our sword, right, in the battle. Let's take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're in spiritual warfare. What's the, what's the weapon? What's, you know, we got the shield. We got the sword. Shield of faith. Faith and confidence in the Word of God. Standing with the Word of God. We proclaim the word, we teach the word, we believe the word, we obey the word, we trust in it. There's other warnings about this. I want you to turn to 2 Peter, if you will. Turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter, along with the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter also warns his audience here in chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Peter. He says, there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Oh, man. Don't you wish you would have said might be? You know, for some, some small few of you in certain times in church history, there might be the chance that perhaps this could happen. He said, no, it's going to happen. There will be false teachers among you. And notice what he says. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies. So they don't ever announce it. No, no one ever walks in and says, hey, I'm a false prophet. It's always, hey, brother, so-and-so, and you love the Bible? I love the Bible. Oh, you guys love the Spirit? I love the Spirit, right? It's secret. Bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and they bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways. I wish he just said few, and maybe you know, maybe one out of a million will follow them. No, he says, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And then look at one of their motivating factors, verse 3. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. These guys are always into money. Whenever you find somebody who's interested in fundraising, just be, just be on guard. I, I'm not, you know, not all fundraising is bad, and so don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it's just an area to be careful of. The covetousness. They'll ex- they're wanting to exploit people and get stuff for themselves, and so they say stuff that's not true. Second Timothy, 
Turn over there, it's back to the left. A couple of books, 2 Timothy. Go back, you'll see Hebrews, then there's Titus, then there's 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, a charge for Timothy, verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And then verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Do you see the repetition of the third person plural pronoun? So who's the they? He's not talking about the false teachers here. When he says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, I'm looking around the room, I see some people enduring it. Some of you are enduring it better than others. <laughs> but you're all enduring it, for the most part, enduring the sound doctrine. Right? So who's the they? Who endures sound doctrine? That'd be us. That's the church, the people. Paul says there's a time coming when the people of God, like even the people of God are going to say, we don't want to hear that. That's too much Bible study. I want to hear about my best life now. I want to hear about how to invest my money. I want to hear about how I can make my money grow. And I want to hear about this. I want to hear about that. The time will come when they will no longer be interested in sound doctrine. And so they will, according to their own desires, so it's lust-driven, and their ears are itching for something, and so they will heap up for themselves teachers. So we're, we're thinking of these parables of Jesus about the nature of the kingdom, and then we're thinking of these exhortations that are given by the apostles to the believers in the first century. The apostles gave, gave really clear warnings about um, the challenges that would face the believers. A time, Paul says here, when in general the church is going to say, we just don't want Bible teaching anymore. We're done. We don't need that. We need something else. Okay. The time, Paul says the time's going to come when this is going to happen. But verse 5, you be watchful in all things. Man, you've got to pay attention. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Just keep going after it. Don't stop. Uh, turn over to Jude. See if you can find Jude. It's just one chapter long. It's a tiny book. I'll give you a clue. Find Revelation. It's right before Revelation. Revelation's pretty easy to find. Find the black cover at the back of your Bible, and there's Revelation. Right before Revelation is this little one-chapter book of Jude. In verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness, and they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a, an interest in sin, there's a corruption of the doctrine of God and of Jesus. But, but these are men who have been able to sneak in. So they're, they're sort of like those that are, Maybe they're the wolves coming from without, or they're, maybe they got in, and then once they're in and entrenched, then, then they start to reveal themselves. So um, these, are, these are challenging um, charges. And when you think of church history, the, the, the church, I mean, it, it, you really can't defend it. I mean, if you, if, you, if you talk to somebody who's been to college, and they had a world history class or something, and you start to tell them you're a believer, and they go, oh, you mean like the Crusades? Like, no, not, you know, or you like the, like, I know about the church, and the church did this, and the church did that. It's like, well, what did Jesus warn? What did he tell us? I mean, these parables, I think, are powerful. He said, it's a mustard seed that a man planted. Well, that part, the man, the field of the world, the man who's planting is Jesus, seeds the word of God, the thing being planted is the person of God. So you've got this thing that starts off okay, but then it grows into something monstrous, bigger than it's supposed to be, and the birds are nesting in it. And I, to me, I look at that and I think, that looks like my church history class. 
You know, I can, I can name the birds. That was this pope who, you know, or this person did this, or this person went and did that, and they did it in the name of Jesus. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It's more, it has everything to do with something the devil would do, right? The devil's the one who beats people up and steals from them and destroys them. Uh, Jesus came to give us life, and that more abundantly he came to lay down his life. So when you see someone going and taking life, you think, well, that's not Jesus. What is that? But Jesus told us, he warned us what the kingdom of God would look like. And this idea that these guys are warning about false teaching, I think this idea of leaven, uh, this short parable, the kingdom of heaven being like leaven, and the woman took and hid it in there, and then it just spread through the whole thing. Um, I want you to see if we can turn to a bunch of these verses. Matthew 16, we're going to look at every time leaven occurs in the New Testament. With, with one exception, I'm not going to read the same verses that we're in or Luke's account of the same verse that we're in. So other than that, it'll be all the verses. <clears throat> Matthew 16, in verse 5, When the disciples had come to the other side, they forgot to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. They reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we've taken no bread? Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you, have, because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Or of the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Look at verse 12. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisee and Sadducee doctrine was different from one another. The Sadducees were materialists who said, godliness is gain. You know, we've got the power. We don't really believe all the Bible. They, they were basically materialists. They, they live for money, but they have put the God card. You know, they had the God name badge. We're following God, but we're rich and we dominate people. The Pharisees were super ultra-legalistic, and they did believe the word of God, but they took it to this weird extreme, and they added to it with their traditions, and their sort of legalism. These, these are two doctrines that are still in the church today. They've been in the church since the first century. The church has struggled with legalism and with materialism its whole entire existence. So when Jesus said, you know, beware of the leaven, and then Matthew interprets it, he meant their doctrine. So in this particular case, leaven used in a symbolic way by Jesus is referring to the influence of the doctrine. That this is the kind of doctrine, legalism spreads like this. My friend Kendall comes to church, and she walks in, and, and she's got this cool, you know, thing, and she's, she's reading her Bible, she's got these Bible verses on a card, and she's kind of sharing with somebody, and, what's that? And she goes, oh, I have this and this. And I see what she's doing, and I think, God, that's pretty cool. I want to do something like that. And then I do it, and I show her next week, but my cards are a little cooler than hers. <laughs> now, why, how did mine get a little cooler than hers? Well, it's natural, right? It's just very normal. And, you know, she's competitive and a track star and all that, so the next week she comes back, and her cards are better than mine. And then my cards are better than hers, right? I mean, how did this stuff develop? How do you get weird legalistic things? It's, it's competition. It's pride. One person does it like this. Jesus talked about how they would lengthen their threads on their robe, lengthen their phylacteries, lengthen the box that they had on their head. Like one guy's got a little box and the other guy comes back the next day with a bigger <laughs> thing. I'm not joking. I saw a guy one time in Jerusalem had this giant box on his head. And I thought, really, seriously? I mean, I'd seen the guys with the littler ones, but this guy went big, you know, go big or go home. So does that make a difference? So yeah, man, I'm more committed. I mean, legalism is bizarre. It's fed by our flesh, but it's like leaven. I mean, it's just contagious. It's like you see it, and all of a sudden, you're just in it, just drawn into it. Um, look at Mark 8. Turn over to Mark 8, because Jesus adds another leaven. It's the same context. Mark chapter 8, verse... 15, same story, they forgot the loaves or whatever. And he charged them and he said, in verse 15, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Well, that's interesting. So the doctrine of the Pharisees, the doctrine of the Sadducees, and now in this, 
this verse, Mark adds that Jesus had also said that Matthew didn't add uh, the leaven of Herod. Herod's like a political guy who's compromised. Have we ever elected anybody to office? I mean, I guess there are some guys that are godless and admit to it, but for the most part, everybody that's running for president all of a sudden is born again and totally going to church somewhere. I mean, it's a marriage of this politicizing and political power and influence and Christianity. Is that a blight to the church? Is that not a doctrine that's a leaven? Absolutely. Um, turn to Luke chapter 12. Here's another way that Jesus interprets this idea of leaven. So this, it's their doctrine he wants them to avoid, but look at this one. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people gathered together so that they trampled one another, Jesus began to say that to the disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So now he's not so much talking about the doctrine, but the conduct. And hypocrisy is like legalism in that it's so easy to spread. Uh, pretending to be something that you're not. Acting differently. It's very important. And I totally appreciate you guys and, your, and you being so honest and down to earth and open with one another. And it's so important when someone says, how are you doing? You go, man, actually, I'm not doing very good. I totally got in the flesh today, and I said this to this person, and man, would you just pray for me right now? If we just, just kill the hypocrisy, just get rid of it. But when someone goes, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing so great. I am too. Well, me too. We're all, hey, doing great, man. Our church, no one has a problem. Okay, well, all right. I don't know that that's actually accurate. <laughs> right? I mean, hypocrisy, man, it's like, it's like spreading the most contagious disease. It's like leaven, right? So leaven is their bad doctrine. Leaven is their hypocrisy. You see in a pattern here? Turn over to 1 Corinthians. We're getting close to being done. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. This is where there's sin in the church, and the guy's in sexual immorality with his dad's wife. It's not his mom. His dad's married somebody else besides his mom. Something happened in that relationship. Now he's shacked up with his dad's wife, and the church is not dealing with it. And so Paul's saying, you guys need to deal with this. You can't overlook this sin and then he, and they were kind of glorying that, like, oh, we're just so open, you know. He says in verse 6, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Is that a positive thing or a negative thing? <laughs> He's using it very negatively. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Indeed, Christ, our, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven or with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's using leaven in a symbolic way or as a metaphor, and he's spelling it out. This one represents the permeation of sin and wickedness. Get rid of it. That's the Passover picture, feast of unleavened bread. Jesus is our Passover, unleavened bread. Let's stay in sincerity and truth. Let's stay out of sin. And then uh, Galatians chapter 5, right after... 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. You ran well, he says, who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So he actually uses it proverbially. And in this case, Galatians, what's the problem? They're leaving Jesus to go for legalism. And again, it's a, beware the leaven of the, of the Pharisees, the doctrine of the Pharisees. So that's how, that's how leaven's used in the, in the New Testament. So let's go back to close, and we look at these two parables. We got one with this growth, birds nesting in the branches. We got another, verse 33, having read all those verses, what Jesus said, a king, the, and then here Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. To me, I just think this is Jesus telling us that we're in for some crazy spiritual warfare. We're walking with him in these last days. Every generation of the church is going to have enemies that are going to come from without, enemies that come from within. And I think Paul's advice to the Ephesian elders is just the best. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified. That's just the word of God. We're going to stick with the word of God because 
there's the doctrine of the Pharisees, the doctrine of the Sadducees, the doctrine of Herod. Those are all things Jesus called leaven. Hypocrisy, Jesus called leaven. The sin that was in the church, Paul calls leaven. The legalism in Galatia, Paul's call, Paul calls that leaven. And here Jesus said, here's what the kingdom of God's going to be like. <laughs> the leaven's going to spread through the whole thing. Super encouraging, isn't it? Well, no. It's really discouraging, isn't it? It's hard. But Jesus warned us. He told us that's what it was like. So we, we recognize it. We say, all right, then. That's the way it is. So we're going to just stick to the word. If somebody comes with some new idea, we're going to say, hey, where'd you see that in the Bible? Oh, I didn't see it in the Bible. I read this book. You've got to read it. Oh, it's a great book. It has nothing in the Bible uh, in it, but it's a new idea. Like, no thanks, man. I'll stick with the word. Stick with the word of God. Lord, we thank you for uh, promising in these parables, and not necessarily this one, but uh, the one with the tares and the wheat, that there's an end coming in which... You, you'll sort everything out. And, and, and Lord, really, truly, we do thank you for warning us that in this world, like you said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And so that we would recognize living in, in these last days that we need to be watchful and we need to be wise. Lord, I pray also, because we, we've had this strange overemphasis of people attacking really good believers, actually, uh, and trying to destroy their ministries. Or we're not interested in taking our eyes off Jesus. <laughs> we just want to keep our eyes on you, Lord. We want to stay simple and humble. We want to abide in your word. So help us, Lord. Help us to be salt and light. Help us to share the love of Jesus in, in this world, in these last days. Open doors for us and use us, Lord. But, but God, protect us. Uh, as Paul, Paul told those uh, Ephesian elders on the beach I commend you to God so Lord we're just asking you as our God please protect us protect us from wolves from without and from those even that would rise up within guard us Lord guard us and keep us focused on you we, we just want to be a place where people could come and know Jesus we don't want to really be about anything else so guard that Lord keep us and protect us and then also Lord help us to be uh, lovers of your word hungry and thirsty for righteousness, interested in knowing Jesus through his word and abiding in his word, letting his word abide in us. So God bless your word to all of our hearts. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.